can you just explain to everybody a little bit about the past four years at USC and the three pillars of this creative process that you just learned? Okay, so I was a popular music vocalist at the Thornton School of Music, but the process that I'm about to explain to you is is the underpinnings of the Thornton School of Music program and the basis of our entire curriculum. So I will give credit to Chris Sampson, the founder of the program, love you. And he's the one that shined some light on this process for me and gave it a name and gave it context in my project. So thank you. In order to tell you how, I used a process slash method that is the underpinnings of my entire program. It's what we do at Thornton for four years and then we learn how to do it ourselves before we graduate so we can create whatever we want. And the process is three steps, emulation, assimilation, and innovation. That's okay, hold on a it. second. So it's so three steps. Are, emulation, yeah. which means to imitate, to match or surpass some kind of achievement that you want. So that means pick something that you're inspired by. Pick somewhere you want to go. Pick somebody who has more money than you that you want. Pick somebody that has a house you want, anything, a North Star. Pick a North Star and break it down. What does that thing have that you don't? line it all out so for me I picked Sarah Bareilles and Brandy who are two of my favorite artists and I broke them down they're both strong powerful fierce they both can songwrite they can sing they can play instruments they can arrange they can produce they're advocates they are powerful in their career they collaborate those kinds of things once I broke them down then it was time for me to assimilate which is step two and assimilate is the 10,000 hour rule step one you find a north star or it will find you yes now you're in emulation phase, and here are the three oh, pillars. Oh, you can't start emulation phase until you have a North Star? I don't think so. Wow. You got to have somewhere to go. Can you start the emulation process by simply saying, I just don't want to be where I am? Yes, but I think it gives you an anchor when you have somewhere to go, and I think that it could just be the opposite of where you are. <laughs> I mean, if, if I'm, if you're, if you're somebody who's, you, you know what I'm saying? Amy, what are you thinking? I think the emulation phase is so brilliant because picking the North Star is something I think a lot of people don't even realize they can do. You know, like they, they just feel like this is me. This is who I'm always going to be. I can't change who I am. I'm not really sure about learning new skills. I, don't, they don't even think about, you know, doing the research, looking at other people. And I just think that alone is brilliant. Mm -hmm. That alone gives you a life jacket. You know, that alone gives you that step up to closer to the person who you want to become. Just knowing like your number one, you can just look at them and, and figure out how they did it. Okay, brilliant. Like, duh. Yeah. Like, okay. Or, or I mean, it do, you when, say that you're, the person you want to be more like your North Star, whatever you want to call it, is Bill Gates. You might not want to be exactly like him in all walks of life, but there might be one thing he does that you want to emulate. Like it doesn't have to be their entire persona. For me, for my specific project, it was because I'm obsessed with and in love with their <laughs> artistry, which is what I want to emulate. But for you, it can be one tiny sliver of somebody's character. I have somebody like that. Do you have somebody like that, Amy? I have a tiny sliver example, but I want to hear yours. No, I want to hear yours first. Well, I... <laughs> you look like you don't want to say <sighs> it out loud. Is, now I'm like, why did I say this? <laughs> because I have to reveal my dirty secret, which is I used to watch the... Um, housewives series on bravo like all the time really yeah oh yeah that was yeah does um, our producer andrea know yes that? she knows we, she used to be andy we, cohen's yes, EP. yes okay she she and i have a lot of deep conversations about that but anyway <laughs> i um i were a very simple simple example i remember there was one woman on the show that was of course always controversial and fucking things up but also really super fun and kind and I noticed she would say like a couple of words that I would never say to people. And it's not what you think. She would call people love, like say, hey, love, how are you today? How are you doing? And I just thought that was just the kindest, most beautiful thing to say to somebody. Oh, thanks, love. I'm, I appreciate that, you know? And so that was like that sliver where she was, you know, this is a super tiny sliver, but she was my North Star. 
And I like got up the courage to start talking like her and start being really open and being kinder to people. And now that's a part of my vernacular. You know, I say that all the time, like, hey, love, how's it going? You do. And I, but that was not me in the beginning. That was not who I was. And mm-hmm. I'm really glad that I, that I did that without knowing the entire process. But yeah, that's what I, that's what I did. And I feel good about that. Do you have one for that like you want to, yeah, that, no, that you want to commence now? A thing that I want to start doing now. Yeah. Probably get to the point a little faster. <laughs> no. Um, a thing that if I want to. If you were st- graduating oh. and you were going to commence. Yes. What is it? It would be from the school of rock hard bodies and incredible muscular abs. That's the school I would want to graduate from. Yeah. I want to, I want to do like a little bit of a body makeover. Mm, you know what I mean? Okay. Yeah. Right. So who would I emulate? Who's your, who's your, who's your dream body? North star. Yeah. I'd have to check my Instagram and get their real names. <laughs> well, let's but, say it's yeah. Gwyneth Paltrow. Okay. Or Jennifer Aniston. More of a, more of realistic for me. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, I wasn't sure if we were going. <laughs> Thanks maybe, love. <laughs> I, I wasn't sure if we were maybe going. Yeah. Maybe well, younger, like same yeah. age, a little no, older. No, it was Risky Waters that you okay. jumped you know into what? and you did it. You so know what? That was Jennifer nice. Aniston is my dream body. Okay. So. So All right. Now we're on the same page. Now you know what I'm talking about. Her and just go with it. The Hawaii yeah. scene. There you go. You want to be like that. Yeah. Yeah. I think yeah. I need to look that up now. Yeah, I, I don't gonna, I don't ever recall seeing her in a bathing suit. We'll stitch oh. that in. Okay. Yeah. Oh. Okay. So anyway, let's yeah. say that she is your dream body as she yes. is mine. So you break her down. Yes. What she does, does she do? A lot of yoga. Okay. A, a lot, lot of, yoga. of yoga. And like every single thing she does. Yeah. You don't have to do every single little thing, but learn a lot about what she does and yeah. start to assimilate it, which That's is step, step two. Yes. Two. Okay. Start to weave it into your own makeup, into your own being, into your own everyday life. Yeah. Do yoga more, eat more greens, whatever she's doing. Right. Then at the end, innovate you're going to have to put your own Amy twist on it because what I'm you need it. to do to get your dream body is not going to be exactly what she's going to do. And it won't look exactly like hers. No, but but, but it, being able to break her down and adding some of her qualities into your everyday will help you get to your own version of that dream body. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. Let's hear a word from our sponsors real quick. And when we come back, Ken, I got another question for you because I'm really curious about this North Star moment. Once you determine that Brandy Norwood and Sarah Bareilles were your North Stars, I want you to see if you can break down the exact steps that you took next, because I think it'll help all of us apply this to our lives. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back. I'm Mel Robbins. I am so thrilled that you're here with us. I'm sitting here with two people I love, our daughter, Kendall Robbins, who just graduated from University of Southern California, and one of my closest friends, Amy, who also works for 143 Studios. And we've been talking about identifying a North Star, which is a person that you really admire or want to emulate in your own life. And our daughter, Kendall, had just explained that she had identified that Brandy Norwood and Sarah Bareilles were her North Stars when she decided she wanted to be a singer-songwriter. So Ken, once you had those two identified, what the heck do you do next? Like what are the, what's the step-by-step process? Now it was time for me to learn how to be a producer, how to be an arranger, how to be an advocate, how to collaborate, all of those kinds of things that I didn't already have. And that will be the biggest chunk of your journey and will take a long time for me it took up to four years it's a lifelong journey so it will take for the rest of my life for the rest of the time that I'm on this earth and then once I was done assimilating those qualities that for example Brandy Norwood and Sarah Bareilles have in their artistry and in their humanity it was time for me to create something of my own and so once I had all the skills that I had to become to be a producer and the skills to be an arranger and the skills to be an advocate and the skills to be a collaborator and a songwriter and a singer, et cetera. I then went and created my own music and inherently it will have my own twist on it and it will have my own flavors of Kendall Robbins on it that Brandy Norwood and Sarah Bareilles will never have. But that's just the beauty of creating something of your own is that it will always be a reflection of you because you're the art 
And I think this process of, I'm going to line it out for you one more time, (laughs) emulation, number one, assimilation, number two, innovation, number three, is a process you can all use to get wherever you want in life, whether you're an interior designer or you're a banker or you're a mom or you're a sister or you are an artist like me, you can use this process in your life to close the gap between where you're at currently and where you want to go. I think this is fascinating. And I can see how I can do this in my life, which is why I'm glad we're talking about this, especially with the example that you gave, Amy. But for the sake of everyone listening, can you make this even more granular, Ken? Especially that first part, because I know that's where we're all going to get tripped up. How do you get started once you have the North Star, that kind of person or that thing that you want to emulate, that phase where you start imitating? How do you get moving on that? So I can explain my program and how it's structured that way. Yeah, in the three pillars. Sense. Will you do that? So first and second year of USC in my in my program, it's popular music performance and there are popular music performance vocalists, popular music performance songwriters, bass players, drummers, guitar players, piano players, etc., instrumentalists and singers. And they our professors p- put you into bands one drummer, three singers, one bass player, you get the deal. And they assign you different songs per week. Um, And the repertoire begins in the 50s all the way through early 2000s into present day pop songs that we cover in class. And so on the first week of class, you get songs from the 50s and the 60s, and they assign these songs to you, and you learn them, and you learn how to emulate them, how to imitate them, which is step one. Can I just stop right there? I thought this was really interesting because this was not like the popular music shows that you see where you're supposed to sing somebody's song, but do it in your own way sort of thing. This was very specific emulating step one meaning they had you singing these songs from the 50s that a lot of you're like are you freaking kidding me this song is so stupid and you were graded on if you're a drummer can you imitate that drum technique and pattern of that exact artist Mm -hmm. like they're making down to the 16th note down to the millisecond of the song how accurately can you imitate it how accurately can you replicate what what the original instrumentalist or artist or group of artists did together? How how ac- you're graded based on how accurately you can emulate it. So for me, it was the intonation, the phrasing, the riffs, the runs, the notes. So for the first two years of my program, that's all we did. Every single song we were assigned, that was the objective. It wasn't to sound like Kendall. It wasn't to be the best I could be and do all my runs and do all my riffs and belt as much as I could. It was to sound exactly like the artist. And the point of that is so you can start to understand the building blocks of popular music. But I mean, for any of you listeners, it could be to just understand where you want to go. You talked about closing that gap, Kendall. When you see the gap, it is so overwhelming because you feel so far away. Like, how did you feel when you were in high school as a graduate, or even right now, how far away as a high school graduate did you feel from somebody like a Sarah Bareilles or a Brandy Norwood? So far, the furthest. And I still feel very, very far from that. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. But is there a difference in how you view the gap? I'm already there. What do you mean? I Well... I feel like I already have all of the skills that I need to have to be a professional recording touring artist. I'm just getting closer and closer to her and building and building and building. But like, I think I already have the skills and the tools and the knowledge. It's just figuring out how to apply them and figuring out how to apply them in a way that gets me to where I want to go. I agree with you. I don't think that we should call it a gap. Gap implies that it's a loss and it's not yes the most beautiful thing in life is that space because you're gonna grow and you're gonna learn and you're gonna fail and you're gonna screw up and you're gonna meet people you love and meet people you hate and meet friends you don't want but thinking about it as a gap is you're never gonna get there if you think about it as a gap it's it's the road you get to travel it's about the journey not about like yeah don't think about it as the gap that's step one yes but step two is I want you to think about it as like gaining something 
It's like a lily pad effect. Every lily pad you light up is yours now to keep. Yes. And so I, and the second thing though, that people feel when they look at that moment of commencement and they look out into the future and they see all the things I got to gain along the way and all this, it doesn't feel like an opportunity. And also people have no idea how to start. And so one of the things that I found to be really interesting about your presentation is that you took Sarah Bareilles and Brandy Norwood, and they were your North Star, but then you divided them into three categories of character, skill, and what was the other one? Career. Career. And by dividing it into three categories, you now made it concrete. What are the skills that I need to gain? What is the character? attributes I need to gain? What are the aspects of their career in terms of their experience that I need to gain? Well, let me just correct you. Not need, want. Great. That want I want to gain. Okay. So why is it important to say want versus need? Because need implies that if you don't have it, you're at a loss. You don't need it. You just want it. And that's beautiful. Well, I think want it's more motivating. Yeah, that too. That's right. Because I slipped into the language of gap and loss oh my God, I need that thing or else I'm not going to get there. If you talk about it in the abundant language of gaining something, all of those things are opportunities to gain something that, that help you walk closer mm -hmm. to the future you. And so I'm curious though, because not everybody wants to be a recording artist. Some people listening are like, I just want to date somebody or I really want to be healthy. Or for me, I see this applying very much these three pillars and these three steps to how do I get my personal financial life in order? I've been living in this mode, I think, of scarcity and fear ever since your dad and I were nearly bankrupt well over 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. And I want to graduate from that. I want to commence a whole new way of operating and there's a lot of skills and habits and support that I need to gain on the road ahead. And I just would love to hear you talk about, okay, you identified Brandy and Sarah, but what would you recommend or what was the next step in trying to figure out, okay, well, how do I break apart who this person is to help me start to think about what I, what I need to gain or what I want to gain. Got to catch myself there. For me, it didn't require very much research because I feel as though I have an intimate relationship with these two artists, although they don't know that I exist. Why do you feel but like you have an intimate I've relationship? I've been listening to their music for all of time and I've spent thousands of hours on YouTube watching their interviews and reading articles about them and reading their books and just consuming everything they put out into the world and so I think for all of you people that maybe want to get into a relationship or start eating healthier making more money or so on and so forth you might not necessarily have as crystal clear of a north star like I did because I think my career warrants a lot more north stars mm. but for example for you you want to you want to graduate from your scarcity mindset in your finances. You might not necessarily have a Brandy or a Sarah, an actual human being that exists on this earth that you want to be exactly more like. So what instead you could do is think about that future version of you. What does the future version of Mel look like who is financially abundant and has an abundant relationship to it? What are her characteristics? What are her, what does her career look like? What are her skill sets? Like you can imagine yourself in a future, in the future, like imagine your future self who's eating healthy. What does she feel like every day? What does she, how does she talk to her friends? How does she move through the world? How does she wake up in the morning? Break that down. You can create it from nothing or you can look at women's health magazine and pick someone from in there and break them down and do the same thing I mean there are north stars everywhere but if you're feeling lost I think the first step is finding somebody something or someone and it can be the future version of you to inspire yourself you need to be inspired I agree and for me with the financial thing 
I didn't have an Erster. I just knew I was sick and tired of feeling either out of control or um, irresponsible or very reactive in that part of my life and that I wanted to graduate from that and commence something new. And the second that I made that decision, right, that I'm just going to graduate from this, I got to end this, I got to start something new, North Stars start to show up. But what I liked about your particular process is I think those three columns are genius. So I want to make sure you listening have these. Declare what you want to graduate from so that something new can commence. If you don't have a North Star, simply saying, I don't want to do it like this anymore. Like I'm done with college. I'm ready for the rest of my life, even though I don't know what the fuck the rest of my life looks like. For me, it was just like, I'm done feeling like this. I'm done operating like this. I got to figure this out. I want to be proud of myself in this area of my life. And I didn't know what that meant. And so just declaring it started to have all kinds of stuff show up. Like the first thing that happened is that is Ramit Mm -hmm. came onto the podcast suddenly. The guy, I can make you rich. And that got my wheels turning. And the second thing that happened is I spent a weekend with a bunch of women that are friends of mine that have similar businesses who are way more successful than me. And as I sat around listening to them, I'm like, wait, you do what? Wait, depreciate what? Wait, what do you do? You, you, you have a, huh? And I started to feel that gap. And then because you had shown me this three step thing, I'm like, wait a minute, I got to flip this. I can gain these experiences. I can gain these skills. I can gain this character that I don't have right now. And so the three columns that I think could be applied in any situation are the skills or doing the sit-ups or doing the abs, but Mm -hmm. there is something deeper in this step one process that your research allowed you to tap into. And, you know, you asked me kind of what's an example of a North Star for me. It's probably a North Star for a lot of people. And that's The Rock. I am so inspired by him. And there's a particular aspect about him that I love. And it's all in the character piece. It's in the fact that it's so clear that he's such a great guy. It is so clear that he is a person that's out there for the everyday person. It's so clear that he's so generous and humble and kind. And I also admire him in that he's such a, like, got such diverse businesses. It seems like anything he's interested in, he's like, whoop, pivot, energy drink. Whoop, pivot, we're doing shoes. Whoop, pivot, (laughs) we're uh, launching the uh, XL NFL League. Whoop, pivot, I'm going to do this superhero movie. Whoop, pivot, I'm going to go do this thing. And I love that about him. You're fired up. Like, oh. I, I think this is a good example of like North stardom that you're- I want to commence you're that. So yeah, you you got the fire in the belly about and, the And so I've never though been able to get past North Star. And I can think about the moment when I was like, there's my North Star. It was a singular Instagram post where he had a photo of him at this huge board table. And it was him and the person that runs seven bucks- their production company, the origin of which is that when he moved to LA, he only had seven bucks in his pocket. And he had this huge team of people and they were launching the tequila brand or they had already launched the tequila brand and they were about to launch the energy drink and they had their, uh, uh, you know, partnership with Under Armour. And it, I went, oh my gosh, wait a minute. He's not doing this alone. Mm -hmm. Oh, wait a minute. He got really into, like, there's a team of people that he like builds these things with. I need a team of people. Like I started to realize, oh wait, there are things I need to gain. Will I ever be him? Of course not. But for me, he's this North Star because it seems like he graduates all the time. He graduates from being a professional wrestler, right? And then he graduates from that role to something else. And then he graduates from that role to something else that he commences. He's always beginning something and gaining skills, but never, ever seems to lose contact with that character piece. And you can see it even in the seven bucks, like the fact that he named his company after this idea of starting with almost nothing. And so... I am really inspired by that. And I realize I got to get serious about doing step one 
of emulating. And that means doing this research and breaking this all down. I think one of the one of the things I like is also that you talk about how you look at the rock and you're kind of like, well, how do I get there from here? Like, how do I do that? And that's, and this process gives you like, okay, break it down. I feel like there are a lot of different parts of this process where people stop. Number one, they would stop by not knowing that they could get yeah. a North Star. Number two, they could stop by being like, well, how do I get to be like the rock? I mean, like, you know, like, the campus. Yeah, right? Huge. It's an opportunity to gain things. Definitely. I'm not picking him for to, my muscles. I don't need to. Yes. Goals. Okay, I don't want to so, pick him for that. But okay. so you could stop there and you could be like, you know what? I'm just never going to be like him. I'm never going to be like him. But then we have this breakdown. What's his character like? What are his skills like? What's his career like? Okay. I could put my hooks into that. Like yes. I could do that homework and, and get. These are things like, that I want. Like Kendall's saying, yeah, these are things that I want. And, and, and you're not going to be him. You're going to get closer. And how good is that going to feel? Mm -hmm. That's going to feel amazing. Like you must have felt great during this process when, or No. Well, did you? No, did yeah. You? I mean, to be completely frank, I did my entire senior project and talked all about all of these different attributes that I had gained over my time at USC and all of these different skill sets that I had been working on. And it wasn't until a week before my presentation that my mentor, Chris Sampson, shout out again, founder of the USC pop music program, gave me this process as context. He said, Okay, yes, you've been doing all of the all of these things. You've been adding all these characteristics and qualities and skill sets and techniques to your artistry and your persona. But there's no project here. You need to describe how you did it. How did you do this? Mm. How did you become this producer and this arranger and this kind and this funny and this humor and your perspective? And he gave me the context of this process so I can promise you that this has been happening for your entire life. This is the way that we live in the world. This is literally the way that we move through the world. It's the way not only that artists create, but that humans create. It's the only way. You, you see another, you're a finance dude. You see another company do something. Boom, the process happens. You just don't have context for it. It all start, the concept of being inspired by something and creativity is just an idea comes to you. An idea, a North Star, whatever you want to call it. It's the same thing. So, I love that. So the mm -hmm. first the first step is emulate, which means to match or surpass a person or achievement, typically by imitation. That's the first step. And in order to do that, to match or surpass an achievement, you've got to break it down. You need to do the research. You need to understand it. Mm -hmm. What are they doing? You can do what I did, which will include my slide. I broke my two North Star artists into their skill sets, their characteristics, their character, and their career. Yours might look different, but those are maybe some guiding lights you can use. And assimilate means to take in information, ideas, or culture and understand them fully. So how do you do that? So what is that, how is that different than the process of studying this North Star? So you, so you study your North Star, for example, yours is The Rock. And you say, oh, I love that he has nine businesses. Mm-hmm. You look at his nine businesses and you pull them apart and you see what they do. That's emulation. You have every little detail of the business. How many people work for them? What are they? What are they registered as? Um, how much money are they making a year? What's their target audience? All that kind of stuff. You haven't started doing that for yourself yet. You've just <laughs> mm -hmm. identified I shit. it. Yeah. No, I've sat and watched and been yeah. in awe. Yeah. But yes. I, and, and, and I think I've been in And now it's time for you yeah. to take in that information, that yep. idea, that culture, and understand it fully. Or you're and not going to graduate, Mel. And to, <laughs> and not only to, but to understand it fully means to digest it. Means yeah. to put to put it in an EpiPen and shove it in your leg. Understand it, consume it, practice it, get in the library, read the book, figure out how to grow your audience to the exact same size that the this rock is has like, his. like the, if you're watching a movie and about this, this is the music montage moment yes. of yes. the change. Yes. Right? It's like that moment where yes. the girl gets the ice skates time and time again, grabbing the ice skates at six in the morning, going yes. to the rink, yes. you know, yes. sweating yes. it out, taking yes. a shower, going to school. It's the 10,000 hour rule. Yes. To master it's something, you need, it requires 10,000 hours of practicing it. And I did that over four years. 
I took classes. I took lessons with my professors. I studied in my room. I sang a hundred million songs. It's this not, is my this favorite is, part. This is the longest part of the journey. And it's the most beautiful part because so many other things come to you while it's happening, while you're trying to take all of these qualities and characteristics of your North stars and put them into yourself. You're going to find new things out about yourself that are part of your journey that you'd never no. Yes. I love that. I love that you said it's the most beautiful part because I think that's the part I'm most in love with too. And I think there's a romantic aspect to it of you taking on a different way of being in your own life, you mm -hmm. know, and that you're purposely doing it to feed your own happiness, to um, explore a skill and deepen it. Like, I just think there's so much beauty to that. Okay. So I know I keep going granular, but I love this three-step process because I love a framework that helps you locate yourself inside of something that takes a long time. I haven't even started the emulation phase because I haven't done the research. I've, I've admired, I've longed for, I've felt the gap. Well, that's step zero. Right. But I haven't done the research, like for real. How do you know or do you know when you get to that part when you stop looking at that North Star and realize that you've become it? No, because you'll never become it. Really? I'm never going to be Sarah and I'm never going to be Brandy and you're never going to be The Rock. No, but don't you become your own North Star when you start innovating? Yeah. I think that... Well, what I'm going to say, which I think you need to include in the podcast, and which is why I'm going to debunk the statement you just said, is that this process never ends. It's not a close the gap. It's a circle. Hmm. It's not a, okay, circle's done. Check. We're good. We're off. No. The second you get to innovate, I, made, I, wrote, a, I wrote a song two weeks ago. I found a new artist I'm falling in love with process starts again you create that business that the rock starts boom you see a tequila company that you want that has nothing to do with the rock it starts again not to mention within each step this is kind of gonna get confusing but within each step the process is happening within each step within emulation it's going emulation assimilation innovation you're innovating in the emulation step you're emulating in the assimilate like it's all happen it's it's a circle inside of a circle inside of a circle inside of a circle over and over and over and over and over which to me means that you've always been the north star you always will be the north mm. star and it's just a trusting in the fact that you're just expanding it's not getting somewhere it's just like i i do you know I what i mean i it's, totally don't know think about it as like i think about brandy and sarah Bareilles as a directional signal not a destination the process that I just went through, emulation, assimilation, innovation in my senior project, if Brandy and Sarah are over here, I'm expanding this way, but then I, boom, there's something over there that I want, then I'm expanding this way. Boom, there's something over there that I want, I'm expanding it. Oh, there's something down here, I'm going this way. Oh, there's something that way, I'm going that way. Like, it's just a constant expansion of yourself. And I don't think that if it helps you to think about it in a one, two, three, so be it. But I think the beauty of this process is that it's not about the destination that you get to because you're never going to arrive where you want to be. Why do you think this is something that my professors always tell me, but people like Bill Gates, people like all of the Motown artists that created some of the greatest records in the world, they're still making music. Some of the greatest scientists in the world are still trying to figure out different hypotheses that they come up with every day. Why do you think they're still doing that? They haven't arrived yet. There's always more to create. There's always more to get to. There's always more that you're going to want to be. And if they thought they'd figured it out, they would have stopped. There would be no more music in the generations well, above you. it's not you. about figuring out. It's about the creative process itself. Yeah, exactly. And that's what this is. It's not about becoming the North Star. It's about... You are the North Star. Yes. It's about just figuring out what you want to figure out in the world. And it's about figuring out what 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 that even means. What, yes, I'm I'm my own North Star, but... Who am I? That's what this is about. Not to get all no. I love woo -woo getting all and woo -woo. higher power. I love that. Who am I? That's what we're kind of here to figure out, mm. and that's just what everyone else is trying to figure out. Well, right. and here's why I love tying the process of changing your life to the creative process, because 
you start to feel lost and disconnected and stuck in life and purposeless when you stop creating Mm -hmm. and when you stop growing. And it's through the creative process of having something that you are drawn toward that you can help yourself grow and you can keep yourself creating new things. And I would say that the reason why the Motown artists continue to create music and the reason why researchers continue to research and the reason why people that have won Pulitzer Prizes continue to do what they do is because it's not about the song or the prize. It's about the process itself that brings so much into your life. It's about the expansion. Yes. Yes. And I've noticed that about you. Mm Mm-hmm. I don't know. I'm about to get really. <laughs> don't get emotional. <laughs> well, I'm about to get emotional because you used to be, and some days still are, but you used to be <laughs> the most tightly wound, gripped. It's got to be right. I'm scared. Like, it's got to be right. It's got to be right. It's got resisting this process. And You know how you can see in somebody that you're very close to what their gifts are? Like I can see that Amy can just open up the portal Mm -hmm. and tap into this higher power in just an extraordinary, magical, magical, magical way. Mm -hmm. And I could say that about, I could say that about Jesse, who is one of the kindest, most thoughtful, like the biggest heart I've ever seen in a human being. For you, I've known since you were born that you're an artist. And it's painful to watch somebody resist their own expansion. And what I witnessed that day watching you deliver this senior project is I watched you like really own it. And I personally believe that it was the framework that he revealed that's been the framework for your last four years, the underpinnings of the program itself and the process that you went through. And it's no surprise to me that days before you're giving this presentation, he's like, well, what you're describing is these three pillars that the whole thing is. And then you could put it all together that that framework in so many ways liberates you from gripping because you can always locate yourself in it. And I also think, thank you for saying all that. And I appreciate you seeing my progress and seeing me. But I also think I can speak from my own personal experience. But the expansion that I've experienced over the past four years, I thought and wanted to look a very different way. For example, when I got to USC, I was just a singer. And when I left, I expected to have an EP in 25 original songs and maybe to even have played a bunch of shows and to maybe be going on tour who knows dreaming big that's what I wanted my expansion to be but through this process and through surrendering to this process and trusting in this process I've experienced expansion in ways I never knew that I would and in ways that I'm so grateful for and would not trade 25 songs for in a heartbeat and I think Yes, this process works. Yes, you can use this process, but you've got to trust that even if the rock is your North Star, if it pulls you in a completely different direction, you've just got to trust that if you stay in the process and you stay present and you stay grateful and you stay conscious of it, it's going to lead you to where you need to go because I've learned so much about myself and about my artistry and about my humanity through this process that I never even knew was possible and I still don't have 25 songs and I'm still not going on tour and I still haven't played that many shows <laughs> and I'm sure those are coming for me, but I would not trade those for the knowledge that I have about me and where I'm at and where I'm going for the freaking world. What's the most surprising thing you learned about yourself through this three part process? My hydrating eye patches are dry, which means it's time for them to come off. Um, I would say that my biggest takeaway after being at USC for four years and from doing my senior project is understanding that my gift is not just my vocal cords and it's not just my ability to sing. 
And yes, that is God given, that is universe given, and that is something that I'm so grateful for and have no idea why someone gave it to me. <laughs> I'm so excited to use it and see where it takes me. But I've realized that my gift and my artistry is so much more complex and so much more dynamic than just these two little things in here. And that's true for every single person on this earth. I mean, my professors say this too, but you work on your artistry your whole life. You work on your career your whole life. You work on your family your whole life. But the art isn't that. The art is you. We are all works of art and living this life and figuring out how to live and figuring out how to be more like your North Star, just like how to be you or going through this process is just chiseling away at the sculpture that is just you. And I think USC has really helped me to actually see myself as that work of art and to see that I'm just hopping on this ride of emulation, assimilation and innovation and I'm going to ride this shit till I'm in the ground, babe. <laughs> and I'm see where it freaking takes Well, I'm going to hook my caboose to that train because the moment that you said we are all works of art and living this life and figuring out how to live and figuring out how to be more like your North Star, it's just like chiseling away at the sculpture that is you. That is so beautiful, Ken. You are the artwork. You get. You yes. can create it. You can paint your own life. Yes, after doing something so extraordinary and you also have made a huge difference in uh, women's lives around the world because you are extraordinarily philanthropic, $40 million worth of product and monetary donations um, to people that are struggling with cancer. And what is next for you? Hmm. Because you are right now in the middle of figuring out on this next leg of the journey called life what your purpose is mm -hmm. and what your next thing is going to be. What tools are you using or how are you thinking about it? And it's really important topic because so many people, particularly after the last three years, have had a profound life change thrust on them. Yes. And they're looking ahead at an open road, wondering what their purpose is going to be, what they're going to do. Can you just speak to that person for a minute about mm -hmm. how you're going about figuring it out? Yeah. So one thing I just want to um, remind everyone to, Mel, because I think people put so much pressure on themselves that their purpose has to be their job. Hmm. or their next job. And a lot of times we can be doing a job that's fine. And, and, and maybe for family reasons, we need that health coverage and we need that paycheck. And, and, and your purpose can be found in the things you do outside of that, right? There's a lot of ways uh, to listen to that knowing and your gut. And, and, and then when it feels right, you know that's aligned with, with who you're born to be mm -hmm. and how you're born to um, show up in the world. And so for me right now, um, you know, there's that famous saying, just cause you can, should you, right? Mm. There's a big part of me now with all these, you know, could I go launch a bunch of businesses? Yes. <laughs> right. Um, and what I feel drawn to is, is, is literally, cause here's the deal. Yes. I've built a billion dollar business. Yes. I have other companies I invest in, you but, also are married and you have two beautiful children. Yes, a two-year-old and you're and a four -year -old. incredibly uh, devoted to your family. Mm -hmm. Well, and here's the thing is like that's all part of my story, but when I when I when I look at my real story, it, it, it meaning the part that ties deeply to, to my purpose, like my real story is a girl who went from not believing in herself mm. to learning how to and so when I wake up in the morning and I think about the things I've done so far, the things I hope for my kids for it is, is, and how I built a billion dollar business, it was really through seeing women, helping them see themselves mm. and believe in themselves and believe they are worthy and enough. And that's what makes, like, that's what fires me up every morning. So when I think about 
what I'm stepping into next. Yeah. Um, you know, I wrote Believe It, um, which is about my book about how to go from underestimated to unstoppable, donated all the proceeds. I'm donating all the proceeds from hundred percent. Um, I funded leadership. Hold on, hold on. Um, let's just underscore that. So she writes a New York Times bestseller, donates all the proceeds from the book. Yeah. To nonprofits. Just donates them. Yeah. And the book is just um from- It's incredible. Mm, thank you. It's like a little manual that you should have on your bedside table because Jamie will be smiling at you yes. and you'll see that you're not alone, that we're in this together. And her example of learning how to go from doubting herself to believing in herself is the journey that each and every one of us is on. Yeah. And so you're kind of in this soup of knowing that this is the area where you want to focus the impact, but you're yeah. not being a very, very, very good friend of yours. I know that you're not, it's still a fuzzy target, so to speak, mm. as our friend Dean would say, it's a fuzzy target. If somebody kind of has a sense that there's something more, but they don't quite have their, they haven't had that aha moment yet that yeah. you had almost 14 years ago sitting on that television set, yes. I'm going to make makeup and I'm going to bring real women in. I'm going to show my skin and I'm yeah. going to solve this problem. I'm going to make people think that they're beautiful because they are beautiful no matter what they're about. And you did it. You did it. But if you're in the soup yes. and you don't have the vision yet, is there an exercise or something that you would recommend that we all do while we're waiting for that clarity and that epiphany to strike? Yeah. Two things. One, waiting for it to be perfect can be the lowest vibration, big, biggest excuse. Mm. Uh, number one reason why people just never try and never get started. So I don't think, I think it's rare to ever have complete clarity. Like this is exactly perfect. for, it. And that's why, you know, I think, I think uh, two things. I think just taking a step and seeing how it feels is good. Tuning into your knowing. I also think, you know, Dean, so 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 you mentioned our friend Dean, he was saying at the fuzzy target, you know, he he was saying something to me recently about, you know, almost like when you're about to aim a, a bow and arrow and you're about to let go of the arrow. He's like, you can aim and, and turn it and twist it a few times before you let go of the arrow. It's okay to wait a little bit and just make sure you're going to aim at the right thing. Mm. Um, and, you know, so so this year, for example, um, I've kind of been doing that. I've been saying, how do things feel? You know, I have the gift and blessing of being here with you right now. How does saying, this feel? feels amazing. So does this mean you, you're you. going to do a talk show? <laughs> Maybe, maybe you could you could teach me all the ropes now and then. Um, yeah, Hardly. but I, I, I am a failed talk show host. Uh, okay, there, don't even. You that want, is true. My is talk show got canceled. Mm -hmm. Why? Mm -hmm. Because uh, I can tell you why. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I was going to apply the lessons from Professor Purvis, but I'd like <laughs> to hear you tell me why. I think our steps are ordered. Why? I think because you are going to own all of what you're doing and make it so much bigger than anyone else who owned it could have made it. Mm -hmm. So uh, by that definition, I think you're the most successful talk show host. That's the first <laughs> thing. Um, At least in the podcast. <laughs> but no, I love, I think it's all going to be the same. I think a show is a show. You know what I mean? It's mm -hmm. the world's changing so rapidly. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and I love too that you can do this show on your terms. It's right? True. You can do it on your terms. And that's why it is so huge because it's on your terms. Well, like you, and maybe this is one of the reasons why we have become such dear friends in such a short period of time. And I often say on the show that I truly believe that the best years of your life and the best friendships that you'll have are on the road ahead. Mm -hmm. But a lot of the reason why we connected so profoundly, even though we are different in many, many ways, yeah. is that it goes back to the Denny's waitress. Like at my core, I am still the waitress making money, waiting tables at the Red Rooster Tavern on Scenic Drive in North Muskegon, Michigan. Same as you, stalling because the fryer has now broken and the fried perch is not coming out. Mm -hmm. And I'm talking to the tourists from Chicago. And I'm treating everybody kindly. And I know that all I want to do is impact people's lives that are just got their head down 
and they don't feel very seen or heard. And I want to make them know that they have it within them to tap into this incredible power inside them to create whatever they want in life. Yes. And it starts with believing yes. that you can and having somebody like you on who has demonstrated that is really yeah. important for people to hear. You know, on that topic of friendship, I love so much that you are the friend that people need to your audience. Like, and, and what I mean by that, and I'm honored to be the friend for this episode with you to everyone. And, and what I mean by that, Mel, is I think you and I love each other for who we authentically are. The Denny's waitress, the Red Rooster, maybe, <laughs> right? And we also are friends that... that um, help pull each other into who yes. we're becoming. Yes. And I think so often, and that's why I love, um, and, and your show also, as you know, of course, but I just want to call it out, that your show can be this for people who feel like, how do I find those friends that pull help pull me into my future? Because so often the people around us, while they might mean really, really well and love us dearly, pull us into our past or for their own comfort zone, want us to stay the person we were or are. And it's so important because we're talking about purpose yeah. to try and, and, and add friends to your circle who, who truly want the best for you, not just what they think is the best for them in you, <laughs> but like want the best for you. And you do that for me. I do that for you. Yes. This show, your show I know, does that for people as well. Yes. And so um, honored to be part of that. Today is the day we're going to stop arguing against your dream and we're going to turn toward it and we're going to start fanning it. So I promised you an exercise because step one is you have to get honest with yourself and claim what you want. That's step one. And so I'm going to tell you that and I want you to think about your dream. I want you to think about what's calling you. I want you to think about the thing that would be so magical if you could make it happen, but you've been arguing against yourself. And I want you to allow yourself to claim it. And as you sit there and think about the dream in your own life, let's go back to Los Angeles. Let's go back to that stage and let's check in with Barbara. Because I'm going to ask her to start getting honest. And what I want you to pay attention to is I want you to pay attention to how much she starts to joke and make excuses and dismiss how serious I am about dreams. Maybe you needed to move to South Florida to actually feel and understand in your soul who you are and what you want. It's a scary thing to admit what you want yeah. because it's true. It might not happen. Right, yeah. And it's, it's, it's not, I've come so close to it happening so many times and it hurts so much. It's all so scary. There's part of me that's like, no, don't do that. But why is it scary? Because I don't want to go into debt and I, I just I want to like be at least somewhere. So I thought, well, I have this, you know. But here's what I want you to understand. You have not gotten honest with yourself about what you actually want. You're putting all the energy into, but I don't want to go into debt, but I don't want to do this, but I don't want to do that. So then you do that anyway. Yes. <laughs> That's the first step honesty. And it's very sobering when you get honest. Because for many of us, I mean, look at me. I spent 11 years making excuses for why I couldn't start a podcast. And all those excuses and the dancing around and the, oh, brushing it off and the, I'm not really that serious about it. It's painful. Your dream isn't painful. Like she's talking about how scared she is that the dream's not going to turn out. What's actually painful is how much energy you're putting into avoiding what you want and what you deserve. And the three big ways that we extinguish that flame inside of us and we put distance between ourselves and the dreams that are meant for us is number one, we, we literally downplay them. Anytime you make a joke about your dream, anytime you're like, oh, I'm not that serious about it. You are putting distance between you and your dream. You're taking a bucket of water and you're trying to extinguish the flame inside you. 
Anytime you make excuses, I don't have the money, I can't do it, I don't have the time. Blah, 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 blah. Same thing. Cold bucket of water on that flame. Stop doing it. And the third thing, when she really gets honest, when you have that moment of reckoning with yourself and you can claim what you want, it's terrifying. It really is because you allow yourself to feel desire. You allow yourself for just a second to feel possibility. Just imagine how incredible it would be to do a stadium tour and sing your own songs. And when you allow yourself to entertain the fact that that's the dream that's meant for you, you allow yourself to stand close to that flame. You allow it to burn a little brighter. And then we get scared. What if it doesn't happen? And you convince yourself that your dream is scary. And your dream isn't scary at all. Your excuses and your fear of it and your joking is what's scary. And so how do you keep this dream alive? And this is a really important exercise, particularly for those of you who say, I don't know what I want, Mel. I don't know what my dream is. I have a very simple exercise that I've taught to hundreds of thousands of people. It's backed by science. And this is an exercise that is going to help you get back in touch with dreaming. See, I think part of the problem is that we've all gotten into this mode where we don't want to get our expectations up. So we put a lid on our own desires. We don't allow ourselves to want what we want. We don't allow ourselves to be in touch with the things that we really long for. And it's the fact that you won't even give yourself permission to dream. That's also making you feel unworthy. And so how are we going to tap back into this dream inside you? How are we going to get your desires flowing freely? How are we going to get you to start to believe that you're worthy of the things that you long for? I'll tell you how. It's very simple. Every single morning, you are going to make a cup of coffee or tea. And as part of your morning routine, you are simply going to write down five dreams a day. That's it. Five dreams a day. You are going to make it a habit to claim what you want, if only by writing it on a piece of paper. And having taught this to hundreds of thousands of people, I already know what your questions are going to be. Are they the same things I write down? Are they big things? Are they little things? Are they things that can happen? What are they, Mel? Here's how you're going to do this. Do not overthink it. Sit down. You have a blank piece of paper. And just write down five things you want. It could be, I want that new Gucci handbag. And you might not be able to pay for groceries right now. It might be, I want my puppy to stop pooping on the living room rug. It might be, I want to be the number one podcast host in the world. It might be, I want to do a stadium tour. I want to write a song that helps heal the world. I want to have a wonderful relationship with my mom, who I currently hate. Your dreams are yours. Do not judge them. Do not shrink them. This exercise is about clearing out the blockage and the gunk that has blocked the highway between your heart and your soul and what you will give yourself permission to want and desire in your life. Your self-doubt, your feeling that you're not worthy, your excuses, your people-pleasing, it's all blocking your access to this longing, to this dream within you. And so we got to just get the gears turning. We got to get these like kind of the, I don't even know what you call it, but this is a way to like grease the gears and get you free flowing. Why shouldn't you do a stadium tour? Why shouldn't you have that new Gucci handbag? If that's what you want, you can certainly do the work to get it. 
Why shouldn't you be happy or healthy or heal your cancer? These dreams are there for a reason. We got to get them out of your head where you bury them with excuses and we got to get them into the world in real time where you can see them on a piece of paper. Now, reason number one why you're going to do this, five dreams a day. They can be the same dreams. They can be different dreams. They can be big dreams. They can be little dreams. They can be thematic. They can be specific stuff. They can be anything you want. We just need to get your dreams and your desires flowing freely without you putting the lid on, invalidating, or arguing against them. So there's a second reason why this exercise is so effective, and it has to do with something called the Zygarnik effect. Now, the Zygarnik effect is a extraordinarily well-documented effect in your brain that was first discovered by a Lithuanian psychologist named Bluma Zygarnik, and she had her first study published about psychology and this theory in 1927. So this has been around for a long time. And what is the Zygarnik effect? Well, the Zygarnik effect is this. Inside of your brain, there is a mental checklist function. And whenever something is important to you, your brain is like, oh, ding, ding, ding. I guess she wants to do a stadium tour. Oh, ding, ding, ding. I guess she wants to get her cholesterol down. Whenever something's important to you, your brain takes notice. It opens up a mental checklist. And then your brain has this really interesting function where it will now work with you to help remind you of this thing that's important to do. It's like a little to-do list in your brain. And the Zygarnik effect is once your brain knows something is important, and it's important if you keep writing it down, your brain is going to go to work trying to help you get it done. And the Zygarnik effect is so pronounced that it is used, everybody, in software design. Yep. You know how they talk about gamification? You know how you got to fill them out a form and then all of a sudden a little reminder pops up that like, you're 64% complete? Well, that's the Zygarnik effect. That's this mental checklist thing saying, you're not done yet. You got a little bit more to go. And so this is so effective. And so again, I'm going to summarize this and I'm also going to help you. If you go to melrobbins.com slash dream big, melrobbins.com slash dream big, I got a free download for you. Not only are we going to give you some of the key takeaways from this episode, but we're going to give you prompts so that you can print out this free sheet and use it every single morning to write down your five dreams to tap into the Zygarnik effect inside your brain to help you keep those dreams alive and to help you start letting your desires and your worthiness flow freely through you. Okay, so we've covered a couple key topics so far. Your dreams are not a joke. They matter. You've got to claim them. This exercise of writing down five things you want Every single morning is going to tap into that super highway and it's going to help you build the neural pathways to give yourself permission to want things. It's going to help you tap into this flame inside you that is burning and that is begging for you to let it help you. And then what we're going to do next is we're going to talk about the fact that once you get in touch with this dream, you know what you're going to do? You're going to do what everybody does. You are going to start arguing against it. You're going to start making jokes. You're going to start making excuses. You're going to start getting afraid. Because once this dream keeps showing up on that piece of paper every morning, once you start to feel the pull of your heart, once you start to notice, as I have for the last eight years, that everybody and their mother has a podcast except for me, you're going to start to feel the pain of not working toward it. And instead of turning toward our dream, you know what we all do? We do what you're going to hear Barbara doing back in L.A. You're going to hear her kicking up a dust storm of excuses, of jokes, of reasons, of this. But here's the difference. She had Mel Robbins on her ass that day, and I was not going to have any of it. Because your dreams are not a joke. Your dreams are serious business that demand and deserve your attention. What if you lived in South Florida and you were comfortable... And you were big. And I was big? Big. Like big, big, big. Well, I tried that. Okay. Um, I actually am like a big fish in like the Jewish community. <laughs> yeah, but, but so hold on a second. Yeah. Stop making a joke of okay, this. Okay, I'm sorry. Right. No, I'm serious. 
Yes. Because this is how you block yes, honesty. Yep. Yeah, I'm funny. So you're you are funny. No. But being unhappy is not funny. No, it's really, really, really not. Especially and, when you have a sister who's like so good at being happy. Yeah, but stop <laughs> making jokes. Sorry, so hard not to. You're so amazing. Uh, I want no, to entertain you. No, I don't want you to entertain me. I, I want you to be honest with me. Okay. Hi. So what do you want? Do you want to move back to LA and give it another try? Yes, and I almost did. And then I was like, politics and oh, crime, and I'm scared. So, so this, what you're witnessing here yeah. is you're, yeah, you're, you're witnessing somebody who is literally trying to extinguish yes. her own flame with jokes. And you are not having this moment of reckoning with yourself. Yeah. I am telling you yeah. that what you're witnessing, we all do this shit. You maybe do it through excuses or heaviness in terms of your emotions or the pity party or the, like for me, always kind of scanning for what's wrong and if I don't see it out there, I find it in here. Your form of this is jokes. It's how you get attention, it's how you get love and it has so overtaken you, yeah. that you're not even honest with yourself about what you want. And the second you get honest with yourself, like this is no joke, like at the, at the end of this, you die. Yeah. And so you can absolutely be a happy person. You can be big. You can be big in South Florida or in LA, but you're not going to do it by making a joke about everything. And it begins with you being serious with yourself. Like you don't have to share it here, but what you write in that journal, better be honest. Yeah. Because it can't be funny. Like your dreams are not funny. Your dreams are serious business. And you have within you the ability to literally write it down and say, by God, I'm gonna do whatever it takes until this happens. Because here's what would be way worse, everybody. What would be way worse is that you spent the next 40, 50 years wishing you had done it. Do you hear everybody there? Hmm. I want to talk to you because I'm serious about this. You have to be honest with yourself. I do not want you to spend another day wishing you had done it. You know, I'm sitting here right now with everybody that is on our team as we're recording this podcast and I'm looking at everybody and, you know, I'm, I'm thinking, my God, you know, I, 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 I look at a Cameron and I'm like, she almost went to law school. And she felt this flame inside her going, mm. Ah, uh, go in a different direction. She didn't know what to do next. She just knew that something else was meant for her. Thank God she didn't go to law school. Thank God she turned toward that pull. Thank God she fanned the flame. Because here's the one tool you need. This is the only tool you need in order to align with your dreams. Every single day when you wake up, you're going to do those little, you're going to write down the five dreams. That's a way to get, get your desires flowing again. That's a way to teach yourself how to start dreaming with the lid off. That's a way for you to really start to get yourself in touch with what your mind, body, and spirit are trying to wake you up to and have you pay attention to the things in your life that make you come alive, that make you grow, you're supposed to walk toward that light. You're not supposed to argue against it. And so every single day, you're going to be working on, okay, I got to let myself desire things. I got to give myself permission to want things. Like I'm allowed to do that. Not only am I allowed to do that, I actually need to. It's part of my life force. And I'm not saying you're just going to sit around and wish for shit to happen. You're going to have to work for it. That's how you get it in life, but you won't get where you're meant to go if you can't even claim what's meant for you. And it is a practice of honesty. And it's a, it's a practice of giving yourself permission. It's a practice of worthiness. It's a practice of self-love. And so you're going to start there, but let me tell you the simple thing. 
the simple thing every single day when you wake up, you can just ask yourself, am I for or against my dream today? Am I for or against my dream? It's really that simple. Your dreams are your responsibility. Are you for them today? Or are you against them? There's no middle ground, by the way, because if you're neutral, you're against. You are either for that dream inside you or you're against it. So what does that mean? Well, when you're arguing against your dream, guess what? You're not for it. When you're making excuses, are you for it? No. When you are afraid of it happening or not happening, are you for it? No. Being for your dream is, first of all, being in touch with it. So simply being in touch with it and claiming it, that's a way to be for it. Another way to be for it is to see reasons why it's your dream, to see evidence that it could happen, to see everybody else out there. In my world, it was people that were launching podcasts. Instead of seeing them as reasons why my flame was out, see them as evidence that, yes, my flame too is going to burn brighter, that they are lights on the path. I said earlier that it is essential when you're going through a challenging time. Your dreams matter more than ever then because if you give up on your dreams when you're feeling lost or on autopilot or you're facing heartbreak, you literally give up a lifeline that is part of your DNA. See, your dreams remind you that this challenge is temporary. Your dreams remind you that there's something greater ahead. Your dreams remind you that this moment, it's a blip. It's a dot. It's part of the path leading you somewhere that you're meant to go. Your dreams help you through challenging times. So don't give up on them. You got to double down on them if things are challenging. That's the best time to create something new. That's the best time to tap into that fire inside you. You need that fire at that time. That's why it's there. You see, I think your dreams have this incredible purpose that nobody understands. What if I told you, you're actually not supposed to achieve your dreams? Yep, you're not supposed to achieve your dreams. The reason why I can say that is because your dreams are not a destination. Your dreams are a directional signal. Your dreams are like this compass inside you, this GPS system that's hardwired in you. You were born with it. it, it, it it's like a beacon, a lighthouse out in the future. It's pulling you through your problems towards something greater. It is showing you that there's something awesome to look forward to. It's giving you a reason to have hope, something bigger to believe in. Those dreams pull you through your fears. They make you grow. They push you through your self-doubt. That's why they're there. They show you the way. It doesn't matter whether you achieve them or not. What matters is do you hear the call? Do you fan the flame? Do you wake up every day and allow yourself to feel those things that are meant for you and fan the flame and be the person that is the force, the yes, the loudest voice for them? It doesn't matter what everybody else thinks. Who gives a shit what anybody else thinks, honestly? And if they haven't achieved your dreams, why the fuck are you asking their opinion anyway? They don't know how to get there. And your dreams, by the way, are not meant for somebody else. That's why they don't understand them. And here's another thing that you're doing. You are literally looking for validation from people who can't even cheer their own selves on. Like, how can somebody who's not even pursuing their dreams help or celebrate you as you're trying to pursue yours? See, this comes back to it being your responsibility. This is an inside job. And when you really wrap your brain around this, life gets freaking magical. Doesn't mean it's always like roses. Doesn't mean it's going to be easy as you walk toward those dreams, but there is nothing more fulfilling than waking up every day and knowing that you are the loudest cheerleader that you got, knowing that you believe that this thing is possible, knowing that you're the one that's for this, that you're validating the, the things that are deep inside of you. That is, that is an incredible way to go through life. And so every single day, you're going to be waking up. You're going to be writing your five things down. You can go to melrobbins.com slash dream big because I want you dreaming big. 
I want you dreaming big. In fact, you don't even realize how much you limit yourself. Kathy Heller, who did that live event with me in LA, she has this really amazing thing that she does that I've heard her do, and I'm going to share it with you, but this is her idea, so I want to give her credit. I want you to imagine there's a blank check in front of you. Blank check. And you could pay yourself whatever you want to make this year. Whatever you want to make this year, go ahead and write it down on that check. What'd you write? 100 grand? Quarter of a million dollars? Half a million dollars? Million dollars? Who wrote that number? I'll tell you who wrote the number. The lid. Why not 5 million? Why not 10 million? And again, if you can just play with me that your dreams are not meant to be achieved, they're not the destination, they're a directional signal. Maybe you're supposed to write 5 million down because that's going to inspire something in terms of your self-worth. It's going to awaken something. Instead of thinking about what's possible, tap into what's true. You would love that. In fact, you'd be willing to work for that if I could convince you you could make it happen. And so the problem is you limit what you claim for yourself because you're thinking about what's possible or what you deserve instead of tapping into what you actually desire. That's a huge mistake. See, a car can probably go 180 miles an hour. That's sort of like, you know, oh, I'm going to drive 40. You haven't even... Tapped into the potential. I mean, obviously, you don't want to get pulled over and, you know, it could be illegal on the right. Of it. You know what I mean by that analogy. How do I stop <laughs> trying to find it outside of me? I don't even know how to begin to find it inside of me. In fact, you mentioned that you were depressed and I was reading an article where you were interviewed and you said that you were writing in a journal during this period. And the first entry you wrote was, I don't remember being happy. And I don't think I'll ever be happy again. And now you're like the, the world's guru of happiness. So in that moment, though, Sean, you had an experience that I think everybody has at some point. I'm not happy and I don't think I'll ever be happy again. And so what are like, what's the first thing that you would want somebody to know if that's where you are right now? I think the very first thing I'd want is actually the recognition, because I kind of wish I had known that earlier, that mm. whole thing we're talking about. I think you're right. I think we all have that moment where we realize, I thought I'd be happy when, and then it didn't work. But then if you ask somebody why they're not happy, they'll tell you about one of their externals, right? I'm not happy right now because I don't have a boyfriend. I'm yes. not happy right now because I've got this guy at work, right? I'm not happy right now because I don't have enough money. Um, so. I think the very first step might be acknowledging it, mm. that the human brain is designed to foil any attempt that success will guarantee happiness. Because every time you hit one of those targets, we change what we think would create happiness. I think the best example of that is actually the pandemic. Because I think at the beginning of it, in the middle of it, everyone thought, think how happy we're going to be when the pandemic wanes. <laughs> That's and true. the pandemic is waning, and we don't have that guaranteed levels of happiness. And what we forgot was, there wasn't 100% levels of happiness before the pandemic, right? So I think the first is a recognition that this isn't working. From there, I think that it requires a mindset sh mindset shift and a behavioral shift. Um, in that article and in the work that I do, I research what we can do to create happiness when the world doesn't look like it should. And I think one Ooh. important caveat to that is that while I'm talking about what we can do internally, that doesn't negate the need for external changes. Yes. We have systemic reasons why there's inequality, discrimination, racism that we should fight. Absolutely. I believe what gives us the power to fight that is the internal changes. Yes. So, um, and that everyone needs to do it, not just, you know, the people seeking happiness, right? And the people who are being discriminatory need to do it too. So let's start but, with the mindset. What is what yeah. is one step, one simple step that somebody who is sitting alone like Sean, unhappy Sean, 
back in, you know, the mid uh, 2010s writing, I don't remember being happy and I don't think I'll ever be happy again. How the hell do you change your mindset? Because if you keep saying that to yourself, you're not going to be able to access happiness within. Right. Well, I think there's something unique in that moment because I was attempting to do something about it because I'm trying to write in a journal to be happier. I'm just like, I don't think this is going to work, <laughs> uh, which we know from research, you know, that's not a great mentality. Like you can predict um, the treat the, the course of treatment based upon whether or not you believe the doctor can heal you. Right. So um, that was a not an auspicious place to start. Okay. So Sean, are you telling us that what you're about to tell us to do is going to work and we should believe in our ability to change our mindset and to take actions and to access happiness. Yes, I would actually, I would wholeheartedly say that not only because I've experienced myself, but then we've researched it ever since. I mean, what I've learned in this research is that depression was not the end of the story at all. And mm -hmm. that even in the midst of a broken world, in fact, only in the midst of a broken world, have we ever been able to create happiness? So the question is, how do we do so? I think the starting point is realizing not only that our, our strategy wasn't working, but acknowledging that there are multiple realities in this moment. And one of them is, you know, I don't have a boyfriend or girlfriend, or I don't have this money, or I don't have this job that I want, or I'm frustrated about whatever it is. I think when you acknowledge that that's true, you could say that's one reality, but there's also some other realities as well. Um, you know, last week, uh, in, in, last week I went to the hospital because I was having chest pains. You were? I'm young, yeah. I was in the ER. I missed my very first talk in two decades. And, you know, I realized in that moment when they strip you of kind of everything and, you know, the doctor's going to knock on the door. When the doctor knocked on the door, I was like, this could change my life. It didn't. I was completely fine. But in that moment, like my whole life changed, right? It, it, my whole life could have changed and was completely disrupted within those moments. I think when we realize that there's multiple realities in that moment. One of them is I missed a talk. I'm not with my family. I'm in a hospital. I don't want to be in. That's true. On the other hand, I'm going home today, right? I'm going home to two kids that I love and a wife that I love, right? Those are equally true, but in the same reality. And because my brain has a limited amount of resources, I need to choose and I need to choose what I'm going to be focusing my brain on. There is so much negative in this world that I could spend the entire rest of my life focusing upon that and upon my fear, but that that doesn't serve me at all. It's not a valuable reality for me that in the midst of these multiple and true realities, I'm going to look at the ones that and focus on the ones that are going to allow me to fix the negative parts of my life, or that are at least going to give me the optimism and happiness and joy to take the next step and the next step in the in depression. I just needed a step forward. I felt like I just stopped moving. Um, so I started doing these habits and these are the habits that we know work. And these are all the things you know about as well, right? The gratitude, for example. And I think that, that this would be my answer to someone sitting there and to that, you know, that, that 26 year old boy who is feeling this, um, was in those moments, I needed to scan. I need to stop scanning for all the deficits in my life. And I need to use some of those finite resources to scan the world for the things that I was grateful for. And it was hard because my brain kept being like, yes, but what about this? Yes. But what about this thing you don't have, right? Yes. So I had yes. to literally train my brain and we train it exactly like we've seen anything else with the human body is I had to keep doing it, right? Like I can't build a bicep if I only lift a weight once <laughs> then I'm done, right? I had to do it every day and I had to create a pattern out of it even when I wasn't sure it was going to work. And even when I could see no change in my life, I'd uh, say for the first, you know, easily for the first two weeks, I saw no change in my life. Well, I want to, there I trying wanna, to Oh, yeah. go ahead. You, sorry. I'm just sitting there writing down things I'm grateful for. And my life still feels terrible. Like I remember breathing hurt, um, when I was depressed because like everything hurt, like and everything didn't seem like it was worthwhile. Um, I what think kept you kept really going? Say, so that's the, that's the thing. And I don't get to talk about this much in any of the interviews. So I'd love to talk about this too, because I think you're going deeper, you know, than some of the surface questions we normally get the, I think that the habits are what pulled me out of depression. I write my gratitudes. I journal, I do exercise. Um, I, uh, write a two minute, uh, kind note almost every day. I'd say 90 plus percent days since my mid twenties. I know that when I don't do those things, it's like when I don't brush my teeth, I get this film in my mouth 
that's what I feel like my world looks like when I don't do those habits. Mm. Those habits are the way, the building blocks for creating happiness. But the turning point for me, which I never get to talk about, the turning point for me in all this was actually not me. Um, my job was to make sure other people didn't get depressed. So I kept trying to be there for other people. I was just supposed to be this paragon of, you know, of knowing what you were supposed to do in optimism, <laughs> right? And I kept going deeper and deeper in depression because I knew that there is a dissonance between what I was feeling and what I was showing to the world. The turning point for me and what actually got me to try to do those habits was at the bottom uh, of the depression for me, I turned to my eight closest friends and family and told them that I was going through depression. And you know, some, a couple of these people were sort of my competitors there at Harvard, right, or my peers. And I, I told them I was going through depression. I said, it's genetic, there's nothing you can do. You know, my grandmother, grandparents, and like it's genetic. I just wanted to tell somebody. But immediately the groundswell of support was phenomenal. They kept calling me, they emailed me, they met up with me, they, uh, one of them brought me cupcakes. It's not what I did it, you know, to get cupcakes. But as soon as I, as soon as I did that, everything changed. And the reason for it was actually a, a study I found way later in my life. Um, it was a study by these two researchers in Virginia, and they found that if you look at a hill, you need to climb in front of you. If you look at that hill by yourself, your brain shows you a picture of a hill that looks 20 to 30% steeper when you're alone compared to that hill that you look at of the same height while standing next to someone who you're told is gonna climb the hill with you. So I said that in a convoluted way. When you're alone, hills actually look 20 to 30% steeper to the visual cortex, wow. which is amazing because I thought we have this objective view of the world, right? That's bad, this is good, this is how tall that mountain is. And what we realized was, it was one of those matrix moments where I realized that the world is not objective, it's subjective. And that hill, those challenges are collapsing and expanding based upon whether or not you think you're radically alone going through this and trying to get out of this or whether you're with other people. So as soon as I did that, as soon as I opened up to other people, that was the turning point because it was the move from happiness as a self-help idea to this rec recognition that happiness was not an individual sport at all. And suddenly that hill of overcoming depression in front of me dropped by 20 to 30%. And they opened up about things they were dealing with. None of them was depression, but it was just challenges they were experiencing. And we started creating these meaningful narratives and social bonds that made me want to do the habits because there was something worth doing the habits for. Mm. So it was a combination of habits and social connection and a mindset shift that allowed in that moment to break from this idea that nothing matters and that there's nothing that I can do that matters and I have to just wait for the world to change. Well, it makes perfect sense. And it reminds me of the fact that um, <clears throat> the Surgeon General just had that op-ed piece that went viral yesterday about the epidemic of loneliness. And in his op-ed piece in the New York Times, he talked about his own struggle with it and how the turning point was him admitting, just like you did, to his college, to his uh, family friends and to a few colleagues that he was really struggling with this. And it was their checking in on him and them sharing back that they felt disconnected from social groups and from themselves as well after the last three years that really was the turning point. But I uh, love that you added that research because it is true. When you are down and sad and you feel like a sad sack that nobody wants to hang out with, that's the story you tell yourself. And that story then and the emotions that feel low make you keep isolating. And it's when you reach out that you change the behavior and you change the narrative. And then that provides a little bit of that intrinsic lift that you need that maybe there is something I can do. Maybe there is hope. I want to um, go a little bit deeper on this because you've been there and I've been there and lots of people listening have been there and are there right now. And so when somebody like you come in or I'm sitting here on the mic, it's so easy to be resigned and like push everybody away and be like, well, that's great for you, Sean, but you know, you don't know what I'm going through. And I think this question, Andrea, it's actually number three, it's uh, Charmaine. Let's play Charmaine's question because I think it's going to help us even go a little bit deeper to provide some hope, Sean, for somebody who's really feeling like I've tried everything. Since my teen years, I've been asking myself, why am I here? What's my purpose? 
How do I create happiness within myself? I've made so much progress, yet right now I feel lost. I feel like a failure. I feel not good enough. I feel like I'm not a good girl. I feel like I'm not a good enough mom to my daughters. I feel selfish. I feel off course and like I'm not living up to my potential. I've done the work. I know this is coming from my limiting beliefs, trauma projections that I have taken on as truth. Yet, here I am, feeling lost, alone, and frankly stupid. I do understand the privilege I possess. I practice gratitude. I know I am blessed. And I do a lot of things right. I don't think I'm depressed. I'm not completely unhappy. So what the fuck am I? I'm in some goddamn vortex of nirvana and hell. Sean, what pops out of you? Um, So many things. First of all, how self-aware this person is, right? To be able, in the midst of this, to be able to identify the stages that they've been through, where they are currently, a recognition of the good, but also feeling like, that they don't feel good enough and that there's more potential. Um, what I kept hearing in my head over and over again is this sounds like me. This sounds so human. I think we fluctuate all the time between this, like I've got things going and then, wow, <laughs> I certainly don't. <laughs> like if I have a really productive Monday, I get everything done and I'm super cleaning the house. Tuesday and Wednesday are terrible. <laughs> like I'm exhausted. I don't want to do anything. I feel like I waste every Tuesday and Wednesday whenever I have an amazing Monday. Um, I think that that's because uh, we swing, right? Mm. And I think what our hunger for is, um, if our hunger is for a mountaintop experience all the time, that we always know that we're loved, that we're always amazing, that we're always beautiful and the smartest person in the real room, I think that that's uh, an illusion and uh, a false desire because um, I think it's an accurate reflection that we are not living up to our potential. I think that that's true all the time. I think that I could be doing better as a dad. I could be doing better as uh, a husband. I know that when I work really hard at being a great dad, I know I immediately look around at all the people where they're doing amazing things at work and I'm like, whoa, (laughs) so by. Then when I do a ton of stuff for work or travel ever, then I'm like, oh, I should be a better dad, right? I swing back and forth between this. And I think what we need are those anchor points in the midst of it. Hmm. So if, what and where those anchor points come from, um, you had me on the show or to join you because uh, I researched this, but you know, I also went to the divinity school before getting into this. So what motivated my beliefs in why positive psychology mattered came from, you know, this, belief that um, the the story we tell ourselves and the lens through which we view the world changes how we act in it and where we find our meaning and where we find that value. And I think that those narratives, those belief systems um, can answer some of those questions about how can I feel loved even when I'm not achieving my highest, right, or my potential. I think in the in the world, that's very difficult. Because we get on Instagram and we know exactly who's doing great, you know, based upon likes, right? Or based upon some sort of quantification or money can tell you who's doing great and who's not. And none of those, none of those fill that, that void. Um, so where those anchor points could come from? I think that they have to come from other people as well. There was a study that came out of Stanford that found that loneliness had nothing to do with actually the number of people within your life. Loneliness was simply the absence of meaning you felt um, in the relationships with other people and their meaningful impact upon you. That if you weren't doing anything meaningful for other people's lives, then you didn't feel social connection for the people that are around you all the time, right? And, and vice versa. So if that's the case, if meaning is what's driving um, our levels of happiness, then I think we actually, my grandmother said it, you know, she's like, if you want to be a friend, if you want a friend, you have to be a friend. Um, and I was like, okay, that's overly simplistic. <laughs> not I also really, want a girlfriend, actually. Right? That's not working out for me. <laughs> um, I, I can't be the girlfriend, right? <laughs> so I, um, in that moment, like I, I, I didn't understand. Now I, I get it. What we're finding is that when people are experiencing that fluctuation back and forth, I think we're searching for meaning. 
and people search it for in different ways, religion and philosophy and psychology. Um, I think that a lot of the things that we search for don't work out for us, which is why we get to the point where she's talked about where we feel this vortex of I've got it, I don't have it, got it, I don't have it, because we're reaching onto things oftentimes are illusory while we're grabbing onto things that are true. Um, my mentor Tal Ben Shahar said that um, you're never as great as you think you are, and you're never as bad as you think you are. And what I loved about that is that meant that there was a middle path in the midst of it, right? That sometimes when I think I'm a great, you know, speaker or whatever it is, you know, then I get I get humbled very quickly by anything, <laughs> right? Um, or if I think that I'm, you know, not doing great, then occasionally I'll get an email and it's like, hey, this was really important to me, right? Um, that that middle path was actually the one that I wanted to be in. And it's this recognition and being okay with, I am not at my full potential, but that's okay. And the reason that's okay is because I'm having a meaningful impact upon other people. So that habit that I mentioned of writing a two minute positive email, praising or thanking someone else, I found that one to be probably the most helpful of any of the things that I've researched because you can take someone in a socially isolated state with high levels of introversion. And if every day they scan for one new person to write a two minute positive email to, they stop on day eight, unless we pay them $15. On day eight, that's when they realize fully that they're not a crazy extrovert with all these friends that they could write to. They're like, I wrote to everyone my favorites list and my mom twice, that's everyone. And then they scan and they remember who's that mentor who got me into this job or who's that high school teacher that seemed to have some answer to some of those questions that that person was just asking. Or what about my first grade, my kid's first grade teacher who transformed my son's life, but I don't talk to them anymore because mm. my kid's in second grade. Right. And you start to see all these people that are in our lives that we're not connecting with. And a two minute email thanking them or praising them or saying, I've seen how you've been going through breast cancer. And it's, it inspires me that you're able to find happiness in low health when, you know, I, I struggle to find happiness when, you know, I, I, I seem to have higher health, right? That those moments that just brief, uh, meaningful act using technology for two minutes, we found that if you do it for 21 days in a row, your social connection score rises up to the top 15% of people worldwide right? That's including extroverts, right? Um, and what we found was that it was, you were lighting up these nodes of meaningful connections on your mental map of social connection. And that, I think if you look at the philosophers, I think if you look at religion, I think if you look at psychology, they keep breaking down this idea that you can achieve happiness alone, that you could just figure out your thoughts enough, and then you did it. You can just maintain your happiness, that happiness and meaning only come from this interplay with the ecosystem with others around us um i love that this, i want to okay. go ahead or if you're about to talk another study go for it oh i was just gonna tell one quick study it's Please. a beautiful one it's not not about humans um you probably heard this one this was also um in the new york times as well they had a there was a study where they, they found all these fireflies uh, fireflies everywhere light up individually and randomly in the dark and that's how they attract a mate and their success rate per night per bug is three percent um, which i'm told is is good but these, these researchers found on opposite sides of the globe, these two species, one in Southeast Indonesia and one in the Smoky Mountains of Tennessee that you can take buses out to go see. And these fireflies have these neurotransmitters that allow them to, to all light up and all go dark at the same time, um, it's, which is beautiful, but not that smart because we live in a survival of the fittest world, right? We're told be the fastest, smartest, brightest light shining, otherwise you'll never, never be successful. Um, and at MIT, they studied these fireflies and they realized we just understand how systems work, that when they lit up together, seemingly with their competition, the success rate doesn't drop. The success rate goes from 3% to 82% per bug. It's not like one bug does better. The whole system was doing orders of magnitude better than we thought was possible because as they lit up together, their light became brighter and it was attracting more and more potential mates than a single light would have been able to do and create these virtuous cycles. And we kept seeing the same thing when we, when we looked at humans. Um, we found that the greatest predictor of long-term levels of happiness, as you know, one of the greatest predictors is social connection. Mm -hmm. It's the breadth, depth, and meaning in your social relationships. So it's not something you could figure out in your head and then you did it and then you can hold happiness forever. It's about finding a way of lighting up with other people and getting them to light up as well. So Sean, what I love about what you just said, um, especially in response to that question from Charmaine, is that I was listening to her just tick off one negative, nasty, critical thought 
after another, I could feel like this heaviness. And then all of a sudden it occurred to me, wait a minute, I bet happiness is broken into two things. It is from the neck up and it's the things that you tell yourself, but it is also, and probably way more important that you think about the things that you're doing from the neck down. And that's where these habits come in. That if it's all doom and gloom from the neck up, you're not going to feel any sort of motivation, hope, or interest in lighting up with everybody else. But if you can force yourself to start ticking off these simple habits that you recommend, that you practice, that you've researched, and you just highlighted the one of taking and making a two-minute note, just a two-minute note every single day for 21 days, it will have an impact in how you feel, which of course will start to shift all that shit you've been saying to yourself, which probably is stuff that you heard your parents say to themselves. And so you are, what I love about your research is that you're also making it actionable because I think that's part of the problem that when we feel shitty and we say shitty things to ourselves, we don't take the actions that actually change it. Hmm. I, yeah, I heard one time I was on a plane and the, the woman sitting I don't know, kitty corner behind me and, you know, to the back. She said she was talking to somebody else loudly that she had just met about all these uh, psychological understandings about herself, like literally a litany of all the psychological problems that she had. And I realized she'd been, and she said she'd been going to therapy for years. She had this incredible knowledge about herself and understanding where she was. And it didn't, at no, no point did she ever mention anything she was doing about it. Right. She was talking to a stranger about it, right? Um, which, you know, was was more trauma dumping than actually trying to move forward. But I think there's this moment where I, you know, I really thought that if I read enough books that I'd find happiness, right? I thought that if I, you know, I thought if I read enough books, I'd be smart and then people would like me. <laughs> that was completely not true, right? Um, and I think that we take these paths and I love what you're saying there is that there's this interplay between the beliefs and the actions that we do. You see the same thing with religion, right? Between this faith and works, right? Like it's the things you believe, but if you say you believe those, but you're not doing any of those, I'm not sure you actually believe these things, right? That there's gotta be connection between those. And what I would say is in addition to that is don't try to do it alone, right? I think that we treat happiness like self-help. Like I, I know our books are in self-help sections sometimes, right? But as soon as we do this on our own, without that friend, without that mentor, without those people that we're doing meaningful acts for, then we get frustrated very quickly and think we're doing something wrong. And what's wrong is actually the formula. Like happiness never works out if it's an individual pursuit. And I I, that's one of that. those other mindset shifts I think was crucial um, to, to find that there wasn't, you know, you can't do enough yoga to force yourself into happiness unless that yoga causes you to be more peaceful with that interaction with your mother-in-law. Mm. Hey, it's Mel. Thank you so much for checking this video out. And if you like this one, I have a feeling you're going to like this one too. I'll see you there.